Praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Pastor Nate, Senior Pastor here at Bethany Community Church. And I'm glad that you've decided to join with us, whether you're a member, a guest, a friend of a friend, or simply found us online. Help us spread the gospel by hitting the share button on whatever platform you're on and allow others too to experience the word of God. Well, as you do that, let us join together from wherever we are in corporate praise and worship.
selflessness and peace My fate was surely sealed Until he rescued me His pardon for my sin His bounty for my need From slavery and shame I am redeemed And heaven can contain the glory of the Son. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way. The grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. My name is Sherry Beecroft. I'm the Director of Children's Ministries at Bethany Community Church. I wanted to welcome you to a little snippet of what we've been doing over the past number of months as we've been meeting virtually. We've been playing some Pictionary, hanging out right side up and upside down. We've been meeting via Zoom every single week. We really just have a great time learning and sharing about our lives with each other and learning about the love of God. In addition to meeting every week, on the first Sunday of every month, we have a little extra extended fun time that the kids have called Snack Chat. Thank <laughs> you.
Hi, everybody. I hope you enjoyed our video. If you'd like to know more about our children's ministry or you want to get involved and join us in sessions, you can email me at children at bethanylaurel.org. If this was your first time joining us today, we would love to get to know you. Just drop us a note in the chat. You can also send us an email to office at bethanylaurel.org. Okay, now I want to tell you a little story. If you don't know me, I have been a member of Bethany since day one. I was little. We won't say how little, but I was little. I was a little bit older than a lot of the kids in children's ministry now. But um, I've grown up at Bethany and I've seen the amazing things that we've been able to accomplish through everyone's generous tithes and offerings. If you'd like to know more about how you can financially partner with Bethany Community Church and so into our future generations, you can check out the app or our website to learn more. And now I'd just like to take a minute to thank God. Dear Lord, I just want to say thank you. We are so blessed amidst all of the struggles of the past year and running into this year too, and you are still here with us. You are never shaken. You are always strong. You bless us in so many countless ways. Please use the gifts from our tithes and offerings in the only way you know how. We know that you have us covered. You know what we need before we even know it. I pray that you will continue to bless us as we move forward into a new year and new adventures. Amen. I hope you all have a great and amazing, wonderful week.
time for the word. Get your Bibles, get your notepads, and turn with me to Romans chapter 2. We're going to pick up this Romans Revealed series and continue to see what Paul had to say in this letter. And as we do that, and as you prepare for that, allow me to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for another opportunity to get into your word. To see what it has to say, not only to us now, but what it meant in its original um, discourse. I pray now that this word might be fruitful, that it might challenge and exhort us. That it might challenge us to function the way you would have us to function and exhort us forward as we do so. So Lord, the, the hearts of those who are viewing this cast, I pray that you've already prepared them and in preparing them, you have also prepared the word that will come to feed them today. In Jesus name, amen. Hey, as we turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter two, um, this series asks one pivotal question of you and me. And that is, what does your walk say? What does your walk say? You see, Paul in this letter, he, he began talking to a congregation with the motive of moving to this congregation and then past this congregation in the expansion and the spread of the gospel. But also within that context, he let them know that he'd been praying for a community that he himself didn't plant. He even informed them of his eagerness and the urgency of the gospel. But in doing that, he also uh, has a discourse with them in chapter one where he pulls uh, out, he pulls back the veil. He talks to this community that has both Jewish and Gentile believers in it, and he points out God's um, response to unrighteousness, even as he has preceded that statement by the fact that those of us who have the faith shall live by faith. And in his saying, he says, the righteous shall live by faith before switching over and pointing out the detriment of not living righteous lives. But then we arrive in chapter two. And it's here where there's some things where God's judgment is addressed. And most of your Bibles will have that as a heading. And I know for some of you, um, this is a different format because I'm more teaching than preaching over this series. But I want you to grasp what God's word here. Because here in this, um, this chapter, in chapter two, we find out something that we don't often talk about. And that's that God's reputation is built on your replication. Let me say that again. God's reputation is built on your reputation, on your replication. And what I mean by that is how you display God in your lives, in your words and in your walk will impact how others who don't know him see him. You know, over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've experienced some of the biggest, um, m most unforeseen things in our nation's um, history in that we had um, people in the country attack the country or it specifically our capital was overrun by American citizens. Now, that is one issue at hand that many of us are struggling with, but there's a deeper rooted issue as well. And that's that many who uh, both supported and refuted claim the name of Christ. Now, here's where the issue lies. They are just as Paul stated in the previous chapter that uh, that God has an issue with those of us who do things against his word, but also those of us who approve of them. Here in this next chapter, we deal with a word that many of us know and are familiar with, but it's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. So let's jump into this word, beginning at verse 21, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 24 as we deal with what does your walk say? Verse 1 begins, it says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you the judge practice the same thing i want to pause for a second before i even read any further because i've heard the statement only god can judge but the reality here that's not the issue that's being addressed the issue is that those that are judging or having a critical opinion of something are doing the same thing so i want to make sure we have the context of what paul is getting at here Verse two says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, 
not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because your hard and impenitent heart, you have you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience and well doing seek uh, for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor, peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no, imparti no partiality. For all have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their and their afflict conflicting thoughts accuse even excuse them on the day when according to my gospel God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law and if you are sir are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind a light to those who are in darkness an instructor of the foolish a teacher of children having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth you then who teaches others do you not teach yourself while you preach against stealing do you steal you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Today I want to pull us in here because in the context what you have is Paul has in many of his letters is dealing with um, a, a divergence of ideology. You see, where Jews are concerned, you have a group that are referred to at times as Judaizers, and they are those who believe, yes, that Jesus is the way, but also that you must fulfill the Torah. And what they mean by that is that you had to, in many cases, had to deal with the circumcision. Paul later deals with this and refers to it as a change from a physical circumcision, which was the sign of the covenant, to a, a circumcision of the heart, which is a change that didn't require the physical circumcision for those who had not had it um, according to the Torah from birth. Well, this is reasonable in the sense that the Gentiles would not have had that. But here Paul does a lot with the law. And what he's dealing with is very much in this. In essence, there's some of that going on in this community where the Jewish population still is pushing certain things that are part of the law, even as Paul is speaking to them about the things of God beyond the law. That Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was sufficient for salvation. And it's not Jesus and something else. And here, he starts to deal with an unraveling like an onion of another issue at stake. You see, in chapter 1, he deals with those who um, perform things that they know better because they had the law. And, and those same ones who would later approve of things that they knew were counter to the law. And here he pushes even further specifically on those who claim to be righteous, who claim to be the judges, who are being the criticizers, the ones that are telling others that they have to be circumcised and you have to do this and you have to do that. Um, and then these other ways also doing things or telling people what they can and can't or should or shouldn't do. And yet at the same time, the very things that they're condemning or being critical of, they themselves practice. And I want to talk to us about that because as believers, I believe that even in the context of today, there's some things that we can take from this passage. You see, as image bearers of Christ, we must avoid hypocrisy. And that does not mean that there won't be hypocritical people. And I pray that this um, 
those who have um, shown themselves to be hypocrites haven't deterred you in your faith walk. But the reality is we're not called to be hypocrites. Now, we have hypocrites everywhere. We have people who are um, hypocrites that go to the gym and people who are hypocrites that work at our jobs. And we still go to jobs and we still go Well, we used to go to the gym and used to go to the job. But at some point, we'll return to some of those things and the places we go will likely have hypocrites. But where hypocrisy should not exist is in the church. We find that here in verses, just right there in verses 1 through 4. Paul begins this section very much talking to that. And that's the first point if you're looking for that. If you're taking notes um, in this teaching series, um, the first one is that we must avoid hypocrisy. See, verse 1 through 4 says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the same thing. Understand what he's actually saying there. He's saying the same thing that we saw in the Old Testament. You see, in the, one of our key figures in the Bible is King David. And King David at one point had taken another man's wife, her name being Bathsheba. And he later goes on to have this man put in a position where he might be killed in battle. He, before he does this, he seeks to try to be deceptive. He tries to have the husband go home and sleep with his wife because David has um, impregnated this woman. And when that doesn't work, he hands him his own death warrant, sends him back to the camp. And in the camp, the, the ruling was that he might be put in the heat of the battle. And when it heated up, that the, 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 the forces around him that were on his team, the people that should have been with him, would back up and allow him to be killed. And this is what happens. You see, but when the prophet of God comes to David, he gives David an illustrative narrative of a scenario whereby David would pass judgment. Unbeknownst to David is that when David cast judgment on the scenario given by the prophet, he himself is the villain of that story. And by casting judgment, he himself had condemned himself to consequence of his own actions. We see the same thing here in this verse is where Paul is not saying that we should not call right, right and wrong, wrong. He's essentially saying, how can you who claim to have the word, who claim to have the law and claim to be living righteously, cast judgment on someone else for the same crime that you yourself commit or the same sin that you yourself commit? Don't you know that in the very words that you say what they're going to receive, that same punishment is duly afforded to you? You see, the problem we have in, in some congregations or amongst some people who profess Christ is that we are um, more than willing to stand up and tell someone else how wrong they are. We'll call them a liar. We'll call them a thief. We'll call them a fornicator. We'll use all the appropriate judgment words and, and categorize it appropriately. But the problem is we have failed to look in the mirror. So our in our righteous indignation, we have become hypocrites if we do these practices because not only are you meant to call things to light that are in darkness, but you're supposed to be the light. And if you say that this is sin but do it you yourself are subject to the same penalty for the same sin you see there's no partiality whereby you because you confess Christ might evade the same consequence that someone else is simply because you're operating under grace Yes, grace might mean that you don't get it right away, but the wages of sin are still death when you sin you still have to repent and yes there are consequences when we sin Today we hear statements that say, um, you know, we, we shouldn't hold people accountable. That's not biblical. We should be held accountable. But in our holding others accountable, we likewise should hold ourselves accountable to the word of God. To not do so is hypocrisy and we're called not to be hypocritical. In verse 2, uh, Paul goes further, he says, we, goes further, he says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. And what he's saying is, yeah, you might be right when you call out what they're doing. But guess what? If you practice the same thing that you're calling out, that same um, judgment of God will rightly fall on you. In verse 3, it says, do you suppose, oh man, you who judge those who practice things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? 
You see, some of us operate from this place of arrogance. I see this and it, and it frustrates me when I see it in churches and it frustrates me, especially when I see it in pastors, where we teach and we preach the word of God. But as of late, we keep seeing people who are supposed to be the messenger and the image bearers of God falling into the same traps, doing the same thing that they condemned on Sunday. And in some cases, condemning it on Sunday while having done it on Saturday, doing it on Sunday and preparing to do it on Monday. None of us are called to do that. Verse four says, "Oh, Paul, Paul shifts gears a little bit. He goes from um, maybe, maybe you know, maybe you just um, you missed it. But okay, so in verse four he says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance?" He goes in one sense that maybe you just didn't realize what was going on, but on the other side, it's, it's almost a statement or a question of, are you taking advantage of the grace that God gives you? And in taking advantage of it, you're explicitly ignoring the fact that the reason he's given you the grace that he's given you is so that you might repent, not so that you might repeat what you've been doing. You see, sometimes we, we think that we're good to go because we didn't get caught the first time. But the reality is, is that God's grace is why you didn't get caught by man the first time. It's not that God missed it. It's not that God didn't see it. And it's not that God doesn't hold you accountable to it. But he's given you grace and mercy so that you might get it right with the hope that you might repent. I think that was a good time for me to express a fuller idea of repentance because sometimes we take this repentance as a I'm sorry or I'm sorry that I got caught. But the reality is repentance in its truest form, it, it involves you turning away from the things you used to do, which means it should come with an implicit change um, that should lead you crawling, climbing, scratching and running toward Christ, which means, no, you shouldn't be repenting for the same thing every day that you keep setting up and planning for him. Instead, you should be fighting and struggling not to do the things you used to do as you fight and struggle to be more like Christ because true repentance will lead to life change. True repentance should lead you to heart change. We must avoid hypocrisy. But remember that that's not the only thing because um, in if we don't grasp that and we don't alter our behaviors and our ways of thinking and our ways of doing things to conform with the will of God, but instead we criticize others while doing the same things that they have done or are doing while we are doing them, we might, we will ourselves fall victim to the same um, consequence. And it's not victim like someone is doing you wrong, but you will be subject to the same consequences. And remember, Paul is talking to the church. He is talking to people who are supposed to know the word of God. And I think we need to grasp that because even we need to take note of this. And here's the thing. In doing that, we get to the next point because the reason that we can expect consequences when we function that way is because God shows no partiality. That's the second point. That first point is that we as believers are to avoid hypocrisy. The second thing is that we have to remember that God shows no partiality. I picked this up in verse six. You see in verse six, um, the Bible, Paul switches over to talk about God. and He says he will render to each one according to his works. That means what you do, God will judge what you do, whether it be righteous or unrighteous. It's based on you. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. This is those who follow and patiently go after the things of God. They turn away from things that they shouldn't do. They're not hypocrites. They're functioning and they're striving and they're pushing to do what God has called them to do. He says, I will give them eternal life. That eternal life was afforded to us in Christ Jesus. But then he says, but in verse eight, but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Understand this. In chapter one, we saw um, Paul say, Paul say that the um, the wrath of God is pulled out on the unrighteousness of, of men who suppress the truth. Here we see that those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness will receive that wrath. We have now circled back to point out the consequences of those kind of behaviors of which hypocrisy also fits because hypocrisy in this sense comes with a tether or a tying to the sin to which you judge but don't fix in yourself 
And then it comes up in verse 9, and the Bible says, There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Verse 11 is the point. For God shows no partiality. That means the same consequence that will come for the, in this case, the Jew, or I'm sorry, or the Gentile will go for the Jew, and for the Jew also to the Gentile. In our day, the same consequence that comes for the person you're pointing to is the same consequence that comes to you if you take the same behavior patterns. So yeah, you might be able to get on Facebook or get on Twitter or whatever platform you have and talk about how um, what someone else is doing, but understand something. If you yourself are functioning in the same way, the consequence that they receive from God is also justifiably um, here for you. It's justifiably here for me. It, it means that I can't tell you not to do something or to function a certain way because this is how God would have us to do it. And then knowing that truth, I function differently than that. In doing so, I put myself in a place of hypocrisy. And because God is not partial, he will hold me just as accountable as he would hold you and the other person we're looking at. This is something that is being lost in our society. Even now we have things going on where we are willing to let one person slide but not another person slide whether it be for racial uh, ethical or status whatever the situation we see this partiality amongst man that does not exist with God and that partiality has led us to believe that what is good for me might not be good for you or, or there might be things that I can do because of who I am that you can't do but the reality is if what I'm doing is sin and what you're doing is sin in God's eyes they're the same and he's not going to weigh us differently as it relates to his judgment He's going to judge us both. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not held to a higher standard. But for all of us who bear the image of God, we are called not to be hypocritical. And we should reverence the idea that if we are hypocritical, God will judge us the same way he judged the unbeliever. You see, in the context of this passage, uh, Paul points to the law. And the law here is the Jews have the law of God. They have the Old Testament. The Gentiles don't. And yet, even with having the law, and for some of us, even with having the Bible, we find ourselves functioning counter to the Bible. And at the same time, those who don't have the Bible find themselves working, um, working or living according to the word un unknowingly. What do I mean by that? I mean, there may be someone in a country that has not yet come to know Christ. They have not yet been given the word of God, but they find it uh, a problem to be a liar. They find it a problem to be a thief. They, have, they keep themselves until they are married to one person. And in doing so, even without the law, or in this case, without the grace that is found in our ability to have the word of God, they're functioning according to the word of God. In this context, the Jews had the law and they wanted to subject others to the law, but they themselves weren't keeping the law. And Paul is saying, hey, understand something. While you might be able to read it and they might not, it's not about that you can read it. It's about what you do with it and if we're not careful we will have all the knowledge to judge someone else because we've read the, the word of God but we ourselves won't live the word of God and that is hypocrisy and God's judgment is not partial and we put ourselves in a place of condemnation and I believe that we need to grasp that and answer that question again what does our walk say and then there's one last thing that as we recognize that we're called out of hypocrisy and that we're also um, need to realize that God is not partial and therefore we're subject to that same judgment that we might seem to put on someone else. We must also recognize that the world's perspective on God is based on um, our living testimony. So if you're taking a note, here's your third point, and that's that your walk is a witness, not your talk. Now, your talk may confirm your walk, may confirm what you know about how you should walk, but your walk is a witness. I want to read one verse. I want to just go down to one verse. In Romans 2, 24, after Paul asks some rhetorical questions that point out the hypocrisy within some of these members, he gets to verse 24 and he says, in light of all of that and in light of your hypocrisy, and in light of the fact that there are some who are doing the word and they don't even have the word, they are living um, 
ways and making decisions that are consistent with the word, even though they don't have the word, in light of all of that, in light of the fact that God is not partial, he says, um, your hypocrisy has led to this statement. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That word blaspheme means uh, a state of blasphemy or to be or become slandered, um, used of God or something sacred to God. It's to slander. So God's name is being slandered, not because God has failed, but because you are faulty. You see, the world will know us by our love is what the, what the word says to us about our faith. They won't know us by because you said something, even though, yes, we may recognize that you have some affiliation by what you say, but it says the world will know us by our love. Over the last week, my heart has been heavy because I've looked at platforms and I've seen people all who profess Christ do all kinds of things that will cause the unbeliever to blaspheme the name of God or to slander the name of God. I've seen pastors get up and their political bias or their political affiliation has caused them to pray prayers that are more witchcraft than according to the word. They're pra I've seen pastors play, pray curses over others who don't agree with them uh, theologically. Or in this case, it's not even theological, it's politically. I watched a video where one pastor prayed that there might be sickness in people's bodies and they might lose jobs and things like that. That's not of God. And guess what happens when we see things like that? Those who don't know God see that. And what they'll do is say, if that's the God you serve, that's not the God I want. And what happens there is that they are now blaspheming or slandering the name of God on your account. Or my account. We as children of God, the image bearers of God, need to remember that what we say and what we do is a testimony to who we believe God is. You see, if I say that God has changed my life, then people should be able to see my walk and see that my life has changed. But if my life is the same as it was, but I'm saying God has changed my life, then what I'm saying is what I'm living and how I'm functioning is a representation of the God I serve. And when people who don't know the God you serve see that, they get an impression of the God you serve. Let me give you an example. You see, I have children. And my children, the way they behave and function, the way my son walks or talks, the way my daughter smiles or doesn't, or actually even my wife, anyone in my house, when people meet them, they assume that one thing or another is taking place. They assume that my children reflect the household to which they have lived. They reflect and look at my wife and say, the way she looks at me is a reflection of who I am toward her or that her parents must have raised her well. But in either case, notice something. The behavior of one individual gives a um, witness or a testimony to the person that they either are subject to, were taught by, or covered by. So as believers, if we say that God is God and we follow him and we're living the word and we're breathing the word and we're functioning according to the word, then our functionality is going to give in a, a perspective of who God is. You see, if I say I'm a Christian and, and by that, by the uh, overall sense of that word means I'm Christ-like, then my behavior is supposed to be Christ-like. So either I'm not being Christ-like or I am being Christ-like and what you see is who he is. And guess what? If I'm operating in sin and someone makes the, the assumption that how what I deem to be okay, Christ thought was okay. What I do it was okay in the eyes of God. Then they begin to say, well, God is okay with this. And the problem with that is is that we then have blasphemed or we've caused others to blaspheme because now they're slandering him because God is a righteous God. God is a holy God and God is a just God. So when we operate unholy, unrighteous, and unjustly, then we are sending a message to the world that our God is the same. You see how God is a consistent God. He didn't, he didn't die on the cross for us to be what we were before we came to the knowledge of the grace and the mercy that was extended to us by him. He didn't call us to be liars while condemning liars. He didn't call us to be thieves while condemning thieves. He didn't cause us to as much as possible live at peace with all men. He didn't call us 
to, to strive to do good, seek justice, care for the widow, and yet he himself not do the same. So when our actions are counter to the word of God, then our testimony is causing others to blaspheme his name. And I need us to get that because right now in our nation, we have a nation that is supposed to be under God, but the reality is it's not submitted to God. And the reason it's not submitted is because the saints themselves have not submitted. So we end up fighting with other people who profess the same king while neither one of us is functioning the way that king would have us function. The Bible tells us to love our neighbor. Right now it plagues my heart. I see Christians bearing crosses that are attacking others who also claim and profess to be Christians. They are their neighbors. Your neighbors are your brothers and your sisters. That means everyone made in the image and likeness of God. Um, you are to love them. That love is not always easy, but that love should be consistent. You should be able to love someone who doesn't look like you, think like you, politically or ideologically agree with you on the basis that you love God and God loves you. You should be able to forgive someone else because God forgave you. The idea that we can be so polarized in the church and yet it be lost on us why the world isn't coming to our Savior is beyond me. When the church is the church, functions as the church, becomes and walks as the light bearers of our Lord, then the world might come to see him through us. Today, we've come to a place in time where we absolutely need to humble ourselves as a church and pray. Seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways because then God will hear from heaven, forgive our sins and heal the land. You see, that passage in 2 Corinthians is directly talking to the people of God. But the problem we have is that, as, as history is showing us, is that even in the church, we have hypocrisy. We have approval of unrighteousness. We have suppressions of the truth from the pulpit to the back pew. We have to walk without hypocrisy before a God that lacks partiality and in a means and in a manner that will give him glory and not cause him to be blasphemed. I'm calling on each and every one of us to reconsider and recommit our walk, to recommit ourselves and our behaviors to be submitted to the word of God. In that intentionally subjecting yourself to the authority of the scriptures, that they might guide all the other things, your ideology, your behaviors, and your politics, not the other way around. And in doing so, I believe that we can begin to give God glory in the church and then in our communities and to the farthest regions of the world. That in another way would be the local, the regional, the national, the international. This will be consistent with how the apostles, the, I'm sorry, the disciples were sent out. Judea, Samaria, all the world, close, further, further out. But first, we got to start with us. And I'm calling us to put away all hypocrisy. I'm calling us to put away all partiality. And I'm calling us to put away the idea that we can function the way we always have. The world needs to see Jesus. But they need to see him clearly through you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for that word. I pray that we might reflect on it, chew on it. Be reminded of it. That we might behave and walk in a manner, talk in a manner, live in a manner each day that gives you glory. That in our walk, others might bear witness to who you are and what you've done in our lives and then seeing it, desire that for themselves. I pray that we might not be the, the, those who criticize and have opinions about everyone else and yet do the same thing that they do. I pray that we might be the walking light in a dark place. I pray that as we do that, not only will our homes change and our churches um, grow in you, but also, Lord, that they might that we might grow into our um, social arenas and that we might share your word and live your word before all mankind. And I pray that in doing that, that you might bear witness to us as we repent from our sins and turn from our wicked ways. 
that in the humbling of ourselves that you might get the glory and that Lord in hearing our humble prayers our repentant prayers that you might restore the land that you might unify us Lord make us one as you are one in Jesus name Amen Hey if you're still listening in right now or you're still viewing this cast right now and that word touched you and you're saying I don't know Jesus as my Savior understand something that Paul said that um, it's not those who just hear the word or just know the word but those who do the word you see that word the Bible tells us was in the beginning and that word became flesh that word is Jesus Christ the word of God made manifested in the flesh as the scriptures tell us the saving grace that we have is tied into the fact that he came lived and died for our sins so now I, I say to you, if you don't know him, that he has extended himself even, even while we were all yet sinners. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but it also says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's an acceptance of salvation and a submission to the Lord tied into one package. He's done the work. He's just waiting for your hand. And if you want to make a decision for that I'll pray for you right after this maybe you've already made a decision for Christ and you're saying that I've walked away I've, I've fallen into hypocrisy at times I've fallen into doing things and or approving of things that I shouldn't have we it all it takes is repentance and a return that repentance taking you away from the behaviors that you're pointing at but pointing you in the direction of God and maybe you're here and you're saying I need to be connected we would love to connect with you, even in this virtual environment. And you can connect with us by either hitting that connect button, going to our website, emailing us, or hitting the connect card that is on our webpage. Let me pray for you all. Heavenly Father, I pray for the for the sinner. I pray for, as we all have been sinners, we all have functioned in sin. Uh, David said we were shaped in iniquity. I pray now, Lord, that you might hear the hearts of your people. For the unbeliever who desires now to believe, who is right in this moment crying out to you, at, uh, confessing that Jesus is Lord, believing that you've raised him from the dead, that he died for their sin on the cross, but that he did not stay dead, that he rose again. Pray that you might receive them, comfort them, and let them know that, that this day they become children of the King. For those who have fallen back or backslid, I pray now that you might remind them that you've always been waiting with open arms for their repentance. In fact, your kindness and your forbearance has been waiting for them to repent. And so now you rejoice and the angels rejoice at their return. I pray that you might hear them as they confess their sins before you right now, wherever they're sitting. That they might know that in their confession and their um, repentance that you have forgiven them. And Lord, I pray for those who are seeking a, a church family and community, much like all of the communities in uh, scripture where they gathered um, by the means they had we now gather virtually and I pray that they might connect in the community so that we can walk upright before you I pray for each person viewing this cast Lord that the word might challenge and exhort that we might not only hear it but we might do it that we might become a true witness to who you are in Jesus name Amen and now may the Spirit of God and a sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with you. I look forward to seeing you next week. And for some of you, I look forward to seeing you on our weekly prayer zone. God bless.